Okay, we uh, took a quick break there inadvertently, and we are going to continue. We have a, a follow-up question from Aaron, and we will listen and respond accordingly. And my second question is, what advice would you give to your younger self just starting out in your communication career? Thank you. Uh, wow, okay, advice to my younger self. So we're, we're getting into philosophy, you're getting into deeper deeper things here. Advice to my younger self. That's oh, a, if you had a time machine, whoo, right? That's no. a hard... Don't ask me that question. question. Uh, you know, I think first off, you know, when you're when you're let's say coming right out of school with a communication degree, and you may have some you know ambitions to get a, to to land a a job that gets you doing the skills that you've learned. I I touched on flexibility earlier, and I think that's an important message to still uh, put out there is that you know you, you don't have to be dogmatic or idealistic about certain things, but to get in there and get your feet wet and, and be willing to kind of go with the flow of wherever you go to work. Wait, not starting out as the boss or knowing right. everything? Are you serious? Right, you know, and it's it's easy to come in and say, well, I'm a, I'm a communication major. I know how to do social media, so if they're going to hire me to do social media, then they need to step back and let me, let me shine. I think that I would tell that individual who feels like that, or like in my case, I, I came out as a, strong in my writing and editing skills, mm -hmm. and, you know, you weren't going to tell me you know, what was and wasn't AP style because I knew AP style, for example, you know, and that was the way we did communication back then. Now it's so, it's already so different just in just a little over a decade mm -hmm. because when I came into the field, it was, you know, you, you were armed with your AP style book. Whereas now we're trying to have these more personal relationships on a communication level. Social media is more like engaging in the conversation, engaging in what people are talking about, trying to steer it where you can but not just coming in and just saying, well, here's how you here's how you write this sentence, here's how you deliver this message, but more like, well, how can I get into the conversation that's happening around me? That's that is that's communication today, is speaking into what people are already talking about so much on on social media, for example, or wherever it might be. We can so immediately speak into the conversation nowadays, like you know, it used to be that you we wouldn't maybe produce an article about the the weather today because this article is not going to go out till next week. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, you know, there's a conversation happening about the weather right now. So how is that impacting wildlife? How are the fires in western Oklahoma impacting wildlife? That kind of thing. So I, I would tell myself to loosen up and I would tell myself to consider other duties as assigned as being a way to develop, develop uh, myself professionally. Mm -hmm. To take those things in stride and to see if those things open doors. Don't just be dogmatic and idealistic about what you're supposed to go in and do. Take the assignments as they come, is what I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, don't complain about uh, the minor assignments, right? Yeah. And look for look for the grander right. lessons uh, because it's you are incrementally going to develop certain skills, expertise, a, a, a flair for something, a taste for something, intuition, instinct over time and and this is an age-old story this is why we have myths like this right i mean this is the tempestuous young <laughs> wannabe hero right and 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 they 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 come into conflict because they can't because they don't have the wisdom that comes with age and experience right and so they need the older sage right the gandalf uh the obi-wan to like walk right, them right. through things um, so, uh, that's, that's an important point. Let me make sure we are still rolling here. We've got, uh, um, got some more questions and let's, let's, let's see what the students have. Yep. Hello. Today I have the pleasure of interviewing Mr. Michael Bergen of the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. Mm -hmm. My question for Mr. Bergen is when coordinating the Oklahoma Wildlife Expo, what was the most difficult task you had to face? All right. So Hello. something, um, an area of experience we yeah. haven't got into yet with you mm -hmm. is your involvement in the Oklahoma Wildlife yeah. Expo. Yeah. All right. So, so the Oklahoma Wildlife Expo is a massive uh, public relations event where we, we, we gather together hundreds of volunteers and organizations to put on an expose of all things outdoors in Oklahoma. You can come to this event at the Lazy E Arena. That's kind of in the Guthrie area. Um, you can come here for free with your family. You can shoot a shotgun, ride a mountain bike, catch a fish in a stock pond. You can attend seminars. You can watch dog training. You can 
uh, you know, you you name it. If it is something that we do in Oklahoma in the outdoors, we will open this event up to, to a booth that, that features that. And people can come and get a taste of the outdoors. You can sample wild game meat, for example. You can attend a Dutch oven cooking seminar, learn how to make biscuits on an open fire. You name it. And so the biggest challenge, I think, is that a lot of people, even the people who are involved in the event, come thinking that they're going to make or create the next generation of sportsmen. I think one of the challenges there is really this is just supposed to be a, a fun, free event so that people know who our agency is mm -hmm. and feel comfortable about the work that we do, while at the same time having a great time. And uh, you know that's probably you know that was initially one of the biggest challenges was getting people to come to this event and uh, and, and leave with an understanding of who the wildlife department is, what we do, and why that really matters to them. I don't expect the fifty thousand people that come to this event to all be sportsmen. They're not all gonna be hunters and anglers and it shouldn't be my goal that they all leave as a hunter or an angler. Research and data tells us that it takes years to turn someone into a sportsman. And they have to go with their dad or their granddad 10, 20, 30, 40 times to self, before they can self-identify as, as an angler or a hunter. Hmm. So we're not bringing these people out here so that they leave a hunter or an angler. We're bringing them out so that they are comfortable with the fact of knowing that there is this there is this great organization, the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation, that's working on behalf of wildlife. That's the message we want them to go home with. It Jump. sounds like between the uh, the Wildlife Expo and um, our earlier conversations about your social media use, mm -hmm. um, that part of that role that you that your entire department embodies is a, is a bit of brand management you're in essence managing the brand of uh, of you know perhaps our, our ideas about outdoor life uh, lifestyles sure. but also the state agency sure yes we want people to uh, to love the wildlife department that's one of the big goals we want people to love us because we want people to we want them to love us because they understand what we do we want people to know, whether they hunt or fish, that there is a, a deep value to having wildlife species thriving on our landscape. And we also want people to know how that happens. It happens via hunters and anglers. Even if you don't hunt and fish, I would love for you to know uh, that, you know, if, if you enjoy watching, even just if you enjoy watching blue jays at your window, you really have hunters and anglers to thank for that. You should give a, a hug to a hunter or an angler that you know in your life because essentially, their money is what's funding the agency that does on the ground habitat work that monitors wildlife species even in the ones that aren't hunted and fished right mm -hmm. so it sounds it's kind of like a, it's counterintuitive because you think of hunting and angling as being uh interests or hobbies that take away from nature you think oh well that person just went and they hunted a deer and they took that deer out of the wild how can that be good for deer well that hunter's very interest in deer is what generated his license dollars that then went to a biologist to, to do research and figure out exactly what's best for deer. Paid the salary of a game warden who enforced law enforcement to keep poachers at bay. It, uh, it paid for a guy like me to be able to communicate the message of the wildlife department on social media so that people understand and maybe even take up hunting and fishing. So, you know, you are managing your, your agency's brand, but you're also representing the species of wildlife out there. You're, you're representing wildlife as a whole, as well as an organization's brand. All right. Hashtag hug a hunter. Yes. Do it. Let's take a question from Megan now. Hi, this is Megan Denon, and Hi, Megan. this is video discussion one for Dr. Castleberry's COM 4603. My question today is for Michael Bergen. I would like to know in what ways and how often do you engage followers on the social media capacities that you are in charge of? All right, so talk about the level of engagement. You mentioned yeah. getting the message out there and the yeah. importance of spreading the message across a lot of platforms, mm -hmm. but are you actually engaging people online? And what, what kind of form does that take on? You know, it's funny because uh, even though on a professional level I am engaging people all the time on social media, my broader intent is to engage people with the outdoors. And so that's not always the case. It's, you know, for some social media specialists, uh, you know, it's not, it's not as critical to me that people engage with a post that I make on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not as important to me as the inspiration they may feel from something that we produce 
to go out and enjoy the outdoors. So there's two types of engagement there because you're trying to engage in one, on the one hand, you're trying to engage people with social media. On the other hand, the more important, broader pictures, you're trying to engage people with the message and with the uh, intent of your organization. If you are doing social media for a company that sells uh, sticky notes, I see some sticky notes on the wall. Mm -hmm. Is it more important that the, uh, that the users on social media like or share your post, or is it more important that they go and buy your sticky notes? So there's, there's two things you're dealing with there. I'm trying, I have that broader perspective in mind, although there's still value, significant value in engaging in all kinds of conversations on social media, whether that's Twitter, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and you know, we, we do, when we do Instagram, you know, we have, we have a, a significant number of people on our social media teams mm -hmm. uh, that are, that are all doing these different platforms with those, with both those goals in mind, engaging people there, right there on the, on the platform, but the broader goal of engaging them in what you're trying to talk about and get them to go do. This gets me thinking about, um, to combine it with the previous conversation we're having, uh, uh, what I'm hearing is uh, that social media is functioning as a means to an end, not as a means to itself, right? right. I think in, in that when we're personally using social media, often our habit is we're, we're self-engaging as much as we're engaging with others, right? The means to an end is to engage conversation, to get likes, to attract more attention. But it's a means to an end when you are representing an organization with your social media because you want, uh, the goal is not just to cr attract, tra you know, create traffic, trend uh, on online, right. but there has to be a monetary follow-up and that's why uh, we, we you know, those numbers matter, those figures matter, is, and how do they impact uh, the actual agency yeah. of the consumer, of the public, yeah. and so on. What good is is endless reach and endless likes and shares and you know all of that? What good is any of that if if it doesn't further the overall mission of the department or your organization? Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right, we're gonna squeeze in one more question here, and uh, I think I think we'll, we'll you know curve this thing. Hello, Mr. Bergen. My name is Chris Peschel, uh, currently a junior at Mid America Christian University. The last few days, I have researched some content of the wildlife department, and I've enjoyed the fact that the Twitter page engages in uh, families enjoying the outdoors together. Uh, that was something that was a big part of me growing up. Mm -hmm. I shared with my dad. Uh, also, your Facebook page, Good Neighbor Farms. Uh, it was also interesting to me because me and my youngsters are trying to grow our first garden this year. Uh, not the cool. big, but we're attempting to see what we can't do. Uh, I have a few questions for you today. Uh, one of them being, what is the biggest pro and what is the biggest con of your average work day? Uh, okay, uh, so real quick. Biggest pro and biggest yeah. con, yeah. and then uh, if, if you can summarize that in about a minute, yeah. then we'll come back and have a final thoughts on sure. on this other uh, organization you're involved yeah. in. One of the, the biggest the biggest pros of going to work every day, I think, for anyone who, who's who's motivated and driven, is just the fact that they get to go and, and earn a living doing something they love. He mentioned his his young youngsters, and and you know, I, same boat. I have a wife and, and three kids, and so you know, that's the biggest con, uh, the biggest pro is that I'm. Is that I'm there at work on behalf of my family to earn a living and getting to do something that I'm skilled at that I've learned to do, mm -hmm. um, and in an average work day, uh, you know, it's usually going to have something to do with you know uh, something I did for the sportsman that day. You know, what did I really do for hunting and fishing or wildlife? Knowing that I'm working toward those ends, that that's a big pro for me. I love the fact that what I do every day has a meaningful impact on our environment and the people who enjoy it. The biggest con. You know, I, I, there's not a lot of just cons to my average work day, I wouldn't say. Uh, in fact, I hope that a, a con is a rare thing, but, but you know, uh, maybe it's, uh, you know, just the general, you know, uh, wear and tear that just getting up and going to work every day can have on you, you know. Uh, you're of course, you love what you do, but you're also, you've also got, you know, uh, the lawn to mow and the, you know, the errands to run and everything else. So I think it's probably more of a, of a life balance thing there, you know. All right, we'll take a quick break. We'll be back. Final thoughts with Michael Bergen.